Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this event, Beyond Resilience, AAPI Cultural Icons in Celebration of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. My name is Leticia Peguero, my pronouns are she, her, ella, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Firelight Media. I am an Afro-Latina with red glasses and curly chin length hair. I have a green sweater on today. As many of you know, Firelight Media is a nonprofit organization that supports documentary filmmakers of color. We provide fellowships, labs, and grant programs for emerging and mid-career filmmakers, and we also produce documentary short films. Our flagship program is our documentary lab, which over the course of over a decade has helped more than 100 documentary filmmakers launch their first or second documentary feature. We know that the future of the lab is bright because joining us today to introduce the panel is Lucy Mukherjee, who has just joined us at Firelight Media as the new director of the documentary lab. Lucy comes to us with over 20 years of experience producing films, programming festivals, and overseeing artist development programs. Her previous roles include senior programmer at Tribeca Festival, director of programming at Outfest and Newfest, and programming director at Tasvir South Asian Film Festival. She is also the co-founder of the Programmers of Color Collective, a group that advocates around greater transparency and accountability in film curation. She was recently featured here in Beyond Resilience, an event called The Future of Film Programming to discuss this work. Please join me in welcoming Lucy. Hi everyone. Thank you, Leticia, for the intro. As Leticia said, I'm Lucy Mukherjee. My pronouns are she, her, and earlier this month, I joined Firelight Media as the director of the Documentary Lab. I am a South Asian female with dark brown hair, up in a bun, wearing a black and white sweater. I'm honored to introduce today's Beyond Resilience event, AAPI Cultural Icons. This conversation features three filmmakers who have been supported by Firelight, all of whom recently screened their films at CAMFest, the Center for Asian American Media's annual festival of film, music, and food. I'd like to acknowledge CAM for their deep commitment to presenting stories that convey the richness and diversity of Asian American experiences. CAM has been a great partner to Firelight and they co-produced one of the films that we'll discuss today here, hopefully. I'd like to also acknowledge and thank the Asian American Documentary Network or ADOC, a national network that works to increase the visibility and support of Asian Americans in the documentary field. ADOC has supported many of the filmmakers featured in today's program and has also been a wonderful partner to Firelight. To open this afternoon's conversation and to introduce the panelists, I'll welcome today's moderator, Gary Leonard. Gary is an impact strategist and organizer from Jakarta, Indonesia, who is currently based in Brooklyn, New York. He is the Director of Filmmaker Services and Impact at Working Films, an organization that leverages the power of documentary film and storytelling as a resource for social justice movements. Gary brings into the field of narrative shift and cultural change a background in community organizing, blending his experience in grassroots movement building and policy advocacy towards collective action and liberation. He currently serves on the leadership team of ADOC, on the advisory board for Open Doors, Doors and, and on, on the, the steering, steering committee for Happily Family, Family Night, Night Market. Market. Welcome, Welcome Gary. Gary. Great. Thank you for that warm welcome, Lucy, and welcome to the Firelight team. It's an honor to be here with the entire, enti entire Firelight fam, at Beyond Resilience and everyone joining today. As mentioned, my name is Gary Leonard. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am a Southeast uh, Indonesian man with a light brown complexion and dark hair. I have a button up collared 
blue shirt in front of a blurred background that is obscuring a pretty basic co-working space. Before we begin, um, I'd like to make an Atlantic acknowledgement that I am joining from the traditional un unceded ancestral territory of the Muncie Lenape and Canarsie lands, also known as Brooklyn, New York. For us, even if we are working on issues that are seemingly separate, the struggle for indigenous rights is deeply connected to all social justice and human, human rights work. For me growing up, I never heard the traditional names of the territories. Indigenous people were talked about in the past tense and all the struggles they faced were in the past tense as well. It is easier to, de to deny indigenous people their rights if we historicize their struggles and simply pretend they don't exist. So I know that this land acknowledgement is not enough and I commit and encourage everyone joining today to help decolonize and dismantle the erasure and struggle against systems of oppression that have dispossessed indigenous people and their lands and denied their human rights. Like many of us today, I'm here with a few hats on. Um, as Lucy mentioned, I am the director of filmmaker services and impact at working films. Um, we are a national organization that leverages the power of documentary film and storytelling as a resource for social justice movements. Uh, working films brings the worlds of documentary filmmaking and social justice together. And we connect organizers and advocates with the right films at the right movements to move the dial toward change on the biggest issues of our time. Additionally, I'm also on the steering committee member of the Asian American Documentary Network, ADOC, which is represented here in this space. And in all of my work, especially within unapologetically Asian spaces, I believe that storytelling has a unique ability to de demonstrate complexity and nuance. And for Asian diasporic folks like me, and those who you're gonna be hearing from soon to reclaim our narratives from that of model minority myths, anti-Asian rhetoric that seeks to flatten and strip, a, strip us of our long history of resistance, organizing, and the many AAPI cultural icons that this work is built upon and of what we are going to frame the conversation today. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the amazing Andrea Lust, who as always will provide ASL interpretation for our show today. Thank you, Andrea. And also if you need closed captioning, there is a closed captioning CC option below the screen. Now, before I introduce the panelists and discuss their work, their icons and their perspectives as AAPI makers, I'd, I first want to play the Beyond Resilience trailer. Beyond Resilience is a series of curated conversations created by Firelight. Beyond Resilience does a lot to keep people connected and keep people talking about films or talking about issues, um, connecting our filmmakers and other filmmakers together. We wanted to create a space where our community, that is BIPOC documentary filmmakers, could lead a conversation. We have to do a better job of knowing that films aren't just what we can physically see on the screen. It's about the people that put in the blood, sweat, and tears behind the scenes. Knowing that what you're so passionate about, someone looks at as unmarketable or niche. Who's the audience for this? Who's going to care about this, right? And, and those simple things that people say are like daggers to you. I think that is the part of the, the violence of the model minority shit, you know, that it like shaves away our history of resistance, of rebellion, of, of ferocity. We have always resisted. We have always fought back in many different forms. It's an evolving form. You have to evolve or not you will stagnate. You have to have intention to change and you have to understand that you're not changing to, to try to give anybody a gift, but you're changing so that you can do your job better. What we're asking for is just proportional access, proportional resources, proportional marketing money so that it does actually meet its mission, so that it does actually um, lean into the diversity of perspectives. I hope that Beyond Resilience will keep its edge, um, will keep pushing the boundaries of the conversations that we need to have, and will keep growing its audiences, pulling in new people from the industry, outside the industry. It continues to be a space where people can have a BIPOC creator-led conversation. That is what it's about. 
Beautiful. All right, now it is my honor to introduce each of the panelists um, that will also include a clip from their most recent films that centers and lifts up AAPI protagonist. So first, um, Ursula Liang. Ursula is a print journalist turned filmmaker who has worked for the New York Times Opdocs, the New York Times Style Magazine, ESB in the Magazine, WBAI, Hyphen Magazine, the New Yorker Festival, and the 2050 Group. Her first feature, Nine Men, uncovered an isolated and unique streetball tournament played by Chinese Americans in the heart of Chinatown across the USA and Canada. Her next feature, Down a Dark Stairwell, chronicled the tragic shooting of Akai Gurley, an innocent Black man, and the trial of a Chinese American police officer who shot him. She is a 2021 Firelight Frontline Fellow, and her most recent film, Jeanette Lee Versus, was aired on ESPN as part of its 30 for 30 series. Now let's play a trailer from that film. Face in America, you only watch pool because of Jeanette Lee. Jeanette is powerful. On the table, she will eat you alive. In black, wants to kill. The Black Widow. I can't believe how she keeps getting up. Her body is quite fragile. It makes the story better when you win. 3030 December 13th at 8 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. All right. Now I'd love to introduce Dustin Nakao Heider. Dustin is a Japanese Desi American filmmaker from Chicago. A two time Emmy nominee, his feature length debut, Shot in the Dark, was supported by the Sundance Institute, Film Independent, ESPN Films. Uh, premiered on Fox and was a New York Times critics pick. He has produced multiple seasons of docuseries on Netflix, ESPN Plus, and TNT. He directed the commercial doc series Dear Chicago via the Bleacher Report and NBA on TNT to promote the 2020 NBA All-Star Game. The series won Best Marketing Initiative at the 2021 Synopsis Sports Media Awards, and his short docs on Jay-Z, Robinson Cano, Kendrick Lamar, and others have garnered millions of views online. Most re recently, he co-wrote Pali, a play produced on the Stanford University main stage adapted from Indian writer Bisham Sani's short story. Dustin is a co-founder of the production collective Bogey. His most recent films, Cambodian Futures, featuring the talented Chicago-based chef Ethan Lim, is part of this year's In the Making series, produced by American Masters and Firelight. So let's now watch a clip from Cambodian Futures. Where do I begin? I'm a Buddhist. I'm a son. Sometimes I'm a chef. I'm a bridge between Cambodia's difficult past and its unwritten culinary future. I want to find out how Cambodian food would evolve if the war had not happened. You're going to announce Rising Chef of the Year. And the winner is... Beautiful. All right. And finally, I'd love to introduce Hao Chu. Hao is a filmmaker and photographer from Nanchan, China. Hao, Hao's work often centers on people finding joy despite structural oppression. In 2014, Hao made his first feature, The Night, about young queer sex workers in China. Pre premiering at the Berlin Ale, The Night won top prizes at Black Movie, NARA, China Independent, and others. In 2017, how Associate produced a stage adaptation of the night performed to critical acclaim at the Tokyo Metropolitan Theater. How is an alum of the residency at Berlin Ale Talents and Talents Tokyo. He has worked in film development at co-production office in Paris and Dubon.com in Beijing. 
In 2021, Chow made a Student Academy Award-winning short film, Frozen Out. His latest film, Here Hopefully, follows Z, a non-binary aspiring nurse in China, as they strive to build a gender-affirming life in rural Iowa. After graduating from nursing school, they worked tirelessly to pass their license exam in hopes of attaining a work visa. That film is a part of Firelight's homegrown series in partnership with PBS and CAM, and will have its debut in June. Congrats on that. Now let's watch a trailer from here, hopefully. My plan has always been pretty simple. I learn English, expertise, maintaining preload. I study to be a nurse, and then I can stay here, hopefully. Wonderful. Um, well, at this time, um, I would love to invite the panelists to join. And we'll go ahead and jump into this conversation. Welcome. I can see you all. All right. So you're going to be hearing so much from um, each of these brilliant panelists and kind of in the spirit of what this conversation is centering in terms of AAPI cultural icons, as mentioned, those who have paved the way before us and those who continue to aspire today. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you. Who are some of the AAPI cultural icons and change makers that inspired you and helped shape and inform your work and praxis. So we can make sure that we're bringing their names, their voices and their work here into the space with us. Ursula, would love to hear from you first. Waiting to go last. Um, I'm Ursula and I'm wearing some aviator glasses and a burnt orange top. I have long brown hair and sitting in front of a kind of white blurred background. Um, you know, I, I'm of an age that there weren't very many icons for me to look up to. I mean, I think now... Um, I take a lot of inspiration from all of my contemporaries for every person, every 20 year old kid that's coming up and making a film that I've enjoyed. I'm, I'm gleaning a lot. Um, and, and I'm really looking a lot more laterally for inspiration. Um, back in the day, there weren't that many people. If we're talking about the film world, you know, Justin Lin was one of the only people that stood up. He's from the narrative filmmaking world. And, and I can't, in my head, I can't think of a documentary person that I knew at that time when I knew of Justin and, um, so I was inspired by, you know, his success with Better Luck Tomorrow. And I really love finishing the game, which I think a lot of people didn't see and, and should see, because that has a lot of, um, I think, a lot of us in it. And, you know, one of the things I really enjoyed about his work is that he was unafraid to make flawed characters. And one of the things I think we struggle with, with um, our community being so underrepresented, is that there's always this pressure to have the perfect representation. Um, if there's only one image of your people on screen, then it has to be something that represents everybody and everybody feels good about. So it has to be hundred percent perfect. And, you know, the reality is that American audiences love flawed characters. We as human beings love flawed people. We can relate to them. And so I'm, I really look to do that within my own work is to make sure that everybody has a lot of texture and um, you know, you know, every time I ask people who their favorite character or subject of the film was, it's always the person with the most, um, you know, dirt on their shirt. It, it's, um, it's it's really um, a wonderful thing to be able to find people who are not so perfect that they're unattainable. Thank you so much for that, Ursula, for bringing Justin Lin and just a lot of the contemporaries that are inspiring you. Um, I really felt that. Dustin, same question for you. Any other um, AAPI cultural icons or change makers that you want to make sure that you're bringing here? here into the space with us as we move through this conversation? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, my name is Dustin the Cow Heather. Um, I'm here in Chicago, he, him. Uh, I'm where, I've got some uh, shoulder length brown hair. 
dark brown hair. I'm wearing a vintage light gray Miami sweater in the middle of my messy office. Um, I echo Ursula in terms of looking at our contemporaries as sort of icons. You know, I think we were all brought together because we are icons as well, right? This is sort of how we've been talking about all this. But from a young age, at least there are two names that kind of uh, come to mind for me as being a young Asian American kid growing up in Chicago and looking up. One was uh, James Eha from The Smashing Pumpkins, who was the guitar player. And I remember that being someone from a young age being like, oh, we can do this also. Um, not quite Asian American, but then another sort of athletic idol for me as a young kid was Ichiro Suzuki. And when he came over from Japan into the States, um, that was the first time I can remember, at least from an athlete, uh, someone that vaguely looked like me. Um, I'm also left handed and I bat lefty. And, you know, I imitated and mocked all of his style and everything as a kid um, when I was playing Little League Baseball. So that was a... Uh, a very memorable one. Um, but just even the past number of months as uh, I've been able to bring out this, this film that was supported by Firelight and get to meet all these other filmmakers that are in a similar space as us, trying to center these stories and trying to bring things into the light. It's been a really empowering and inspiring few months. Um, you know, I've gotten to meet Howe in different settings and other filmmakers in different spaces as well. So it feels like the best is yet to come in a lot of ways. I love that. Thank you so much, Dusty. It's really funny when when you and I connected before this, it was like, are we talking about other cultural icons or am I the icon? And, and each of you are truly icons. So thank you for that. And thank you for bringing Ichiro here into this space as well. Um, how, same question, um, who, who, who do you draw inspiration from and uh, who do you want to bring into the space with us? Yeah, well, um, first of all, hi, everyone. My name is Hao. I'm a... Um, brown skin person with straight uh, black hair. Uh, I'm wearing a, a flower button up shirt um, and with a yellow, white, black pattern. There's a lot of color on my shirt. Uh, and I'm sitting in a room uh, that has uh, lots of artwork on, on the wall. Um, I think, well, first of all, the first person that come to my mind would be Ang Lee for me uh, as a, you know, as someone who grew up in China and um, wanted to make films or, you know, want to be become a filmmaker. And Ang Lee is a, the person that, at least for me when I was growing up, that uh, someone who who's a Asian American and who is doing very well winning Oscars, you know, um, and making films about, not just about, you know, Asian um, stories, but stories about, um, I don't know, white people or people that is not what, you know, um, an Asian American is normally making. I think um, he's, he's iconic in a way that I think he really transcend uh, different cultures and he made great films that um, very popular, you know, and but also very artistic. And um, I, I think after that, um, there are more and more directors that I think I can look upon to, like Chloe Zhao, like Lulu Wang, and a lot of Asian actresses too, actually, Michelle Yao. I, I watch Michelle Yao's. Uh, early Hong Kong Kung Fu films until most recent, you know, everything everywhere all at once. So um, I I think for me there there are there are a lots of different kind of icons that um, did very well in the past, but I think now I see I see a lot, a lot of success. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you so much for that. And again, I, I know that those folks that are joining now, um, the, this this field and specifically in terms of Asian diasporic storytelling is really rich with icons. Um, and I would be remiss um, not to mention an icon of which Ursula, uh, your film is centered around, uh, Jeanette Lee. Um, I very much have memories of, of Black Widow um, slaying it on the pool table, um, who was very much an outsized character in the world of pool. Um, so for you, when you were creating this film, what characteristic or trait 
or description do you think was missing from past portraits of Jeanette Lee that you really wanted to get across um, with this film as you were telling this story? You know what? I felt like a lot was missing. Um, she was her own marketing machine. That was part of how she got to where she was in terms of visibility. Um, and every interview that I watched seemed to have the same talking points. And so I felt like she had a one sheet that she kept putting out there and um, people just use that sort of flattened version of her. And when we started looking at all the archival material and had the raw tapes, we would see all these in-between moments um, where she would, you know, wipe away sort of that PR version of herself. And she would have a lot of like questioning and uncertainty. Um, and we thought that was like a really, really interesting space to play. And I, I don't love films that are like, um, have a lot of resolution and and don't let the audience think a lot. And so I really love this like mucky gray space that she was existing in, you know, when the camera sort of turned to the side or paused. And um, so that's something I wanted to bring into the film. And also her sister started talking about, um, you know, she started talking about Han and, and things that sort of come out of the Korean culture that, um, you know, sort of, a, 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 and how unsettled her sister was. And, and this sort of related to so many things in her life. And so that was one of the threads we really wanted to um, bring through the film. And, and again, you know, I, I you know, she, she was always um, an outsized personality, but there was this whole backstory too, um, that people didn't know about in terms of what she was dealing with um, physically, what she was dealing with on the tour, and sort of all of the challenges that she was being faced with, I think were important to bring to the surface. Thank you for that, Ursula. Kind of want to build off of that a little bit. Um, given the platform, the audience of, of Jeanette, Jeanette Lee versus um, on ESPN 30 over 30, um, you've had you know a lot of experience with distributors and, and around distribution. Um, in, in your opinion, have you seen a marked change in the appetite of docs that are centering a API protagonist? Oh yeah, I feel like there there was a huge difference um, when Crazy Rich Asians came out and made all that money. Um, I felt like immediately everybody wanted the next Crazy Rich Asians, um, and you know I, I think there's been a, there's there's you know I I love that teaser that you played because it, I think it had I think it was Grace Lee that said something about. Um, or, or it was PJ talking about sort of the feeling of being told your story isn't for everybody and how that, and those like little things that people say to you when they talk about marketing your film or giving you money for your film that really like, you know, they're, they're saying these things as asides, but they're, they're the type of things that really hit you um, personally. They feel like a punch to the chest. And, um, I, you know, I think right now it seems like, you know, the, the success of the Oscars the last couple of years um, there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for the market. Um, if you've looked at the numbers and I had to look at the numbers and marketing my own work and even trying to sell my film to distributors, um, the, if you look at like the Nielsen reports for Asian American, um, consumption of film and, and television, our numbers are really high and outsized for our, our population. And so we are as consumers, um, really hungering for content that we really want, that we want, we see, we want to see our own self reflected in. And, um, and I think that uh, it's a great thing that people are starting to recognize that, but it's been a struggle um, over the years um, to, to compete against people's misperceptions of who the audiences are for our films, um, assuming that the audiences for our films are only Asian Americans and assuming that Asian Americans aren't enough um, to build these films around. Thank you so much for that, Ursula. Um, I am going to switch gears here, but um, I really want to invite the audience as well as, you know, these uh, panelists are sharing as this conversation is moving. If you have any questions that spark interest, uh, please share those. Um, we There will be space um, towards a lot of part of this conversation to, to share them out. Um, so would love to love to hear from you. I want to switch gears. Uh, Dusty. Um, I'm really fascinated about your your career trajectory. Um, this is the first time uh, that you're really telling an Asian story, specifically uh, with Cambodian futures, given your really extensive background in different spaces. So um, kind of think building off of, you know, what has been said here, but also specifically for you, um, what was that process and what has the process been like for you, both in terms of an overall filmmaking practice and the intentionality within this story and even kind of the the internal piece of, of you as an Asian maker and creator um, perhaps has opened up for you um, as it pertains specifically in terms of identity and culture. Um, anything specifically salient that you want to share as part of uh, what this experience has been for you with Cambodian Futures? 
Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, a lot to kind of unpack. Um, I can't say that when I set out to make this film initially, it was like, oh, I'm going to make my first Asian film or first film with Asian subject matter, just sort of now that I've kind of come on the other side of it and and seeing how the, the project's been framed and as it's been discussed, it's obviously a clear and important part of it. Um, for me personally, uh, you know, I'm not Cambodian and the film deals with a lot of uh, heavier, more intense, traumatic history of the Cambodian um, genocide and just Cambodian history in general. And I was aware of some of that history, but it wasn't something um, that I was consider myself an expert on and by any stretch. So it was important for me to have collaborators on both sides of the camera that could speak to that um, history. And so I had a great uh, Cambodian producer named Tavari Crouch that was actually introduced to me by the chef. And we worked as a partnership with the uh, National Cambodian Museum here in Chicago to help kind of bridge those gaps. And um, for me personally, some of my own family history isn't necessarily reflected in the film, yet by working on a project about refugees and about displacement and about identity and about, you know, resettling and immigration. Those are things that are all very close to my personal family history. You know, my father is a former refugee who was um, in, uh, lived in India during the partition and then moved up to Pakistan and to Karachi in the late 40s, early 50s. And then on my mother's side of the family, they, my mom's side of the family is multi-generation multi American, but during World War II, they were all interred. So those kind of ideas of and themes of displacement and starting new and trying to make sense of the past and to forge towards the future, those were things that were all very personal for me. And I was able to kind of process them through the work. So in the way that I think about it, it feels like kind of an internal door that I didn't even necessarily process or think of got opened through the making of this film. And like I said, my family history isn't necessarily on screen, but I found myself processing and dealing with that stuff. And through that history, through the film, um, just by collaborating with Ethan, the chef in making this project. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dusty. Your, the vulnerability, and I just really appreciate what you you shared in terms of um, the camera itself becoming a vessel uh, for this internal door in terms of what you were, you were the story that you were capturing on camera, but also what it was unlocking for you as well. Um, I, I just really resonates with me. Um, Hal, wanna wanna um, hand it over to you. Um, would love to bring your voice into this space. Um, so uh, there, there can be at times a bit of a a bi coastal bias, if you will. Um, and so I think it's just really important for more BIPOC, um, you know, makers to be able to have the resources that they need, specifically in in the Midwest, um, of which you are based. Um, so we'd love to hear from you how in terms of what are the tension points or struggles, if any, um, that you find uh, being an Asian filmmaker that's based in the Midwest? Um, and have you been able to find the community and support to tell the stories um, where you are and, and any other insights that you want to share um, as part of that process? Yeah, um, thank you. That's a really, really great question. Um, I think um, um, most of the filmmakers, Asian filmmakers, uh, based in Chicago, the largest city in the Midwest. And we have, you know, few Asian filmmakers that I met across the, I guess, rural Midwest outside of Chicago. Um, it is a very small community that um, there's not many Asian filmmakers per se. Um, but I think, um, because I think, well, for my own project or for the past Firelight supported project, I could do it because they 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 specifically wanted to support me uh, Midwest voices, mid voice Midwest stories. So um, I I feel like um, again like that I'm based in the Midwest, so I can tell a story from the Midwest, but. Um, it is a place that still, you know, majorly, majorly um, 
white people, you know, dominated um, society. That's that's how I feel. But I think that's why I'm here because I kind of interested in um, telling stories about people who are Asians are actually living in those kind of uh, society. Um, so um, yeah, um, and I because I I witness a lot of like uh, Asian people in general uh, in even the smallest uh, Midwest town that I travel to. So there are stories everywhere in the Midwest, and I think um, as a filmmaker who based in the Midwest, I, I think it's it's very natural for me to tell a story from the Midwest. Um, it is very challenging in in terms of you know finding collaborators, finding the right resources to to make any film project, uh, especially in the Midwest. And I think for me, it's still a learning process. Um, um, I'm still new to to the U.S. and um, I'm still still navigating and figure out how to actually uh, make films and have a career in the Midwest. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Hao. Um, there are just a lot of phenomenal um, Asian filmmakers that are in the Midwest, you being one of them. So I'm, I'm excited about this emergence that's coming. And something that I want to name in terms of holding a mirror up to myself as part of moderation, I've noticed that I've been using language interchangeably here in this space. Um, I've used AAPI, I've used Asian, and I've used Asian diasporic. So there's a question that I have for you, Hao. Um, you know, specifically in terms of the title of this panel, um, and, and just the term AAPI itself can be challenging, specifically in terms of how it can generalize our struggles and it can equate our communities when that's not true. Um, it can even be complicit in its erasure. So given, you know, what you shared in terms of the vulnerability, in terms of like you're, you're kind of still leaning into this, right, in terms of both be a filmmaker, being in the Midwest, but also kind of your identity, um, how has that shown up for you um, so far as a filmmaker, uh, both in front of the, in front and behind the, the lens? Yeah, um, I, I really, again, appreciate your um, really great questions. I think for me, it, I guess one example that's really interesting for me that I recently encountered is that um, now I'm back to Iowa to make another documentary project. And then some friends in Iowa commented or just, you know, in general saying like, why are you keep making projects in Iowa? And then I told them, well, I came to the U.S. in 2019, and Iowa is the only place I stayed for the past few years. And I have no connection. I know no one from anywhere else outside of Iowa. And I meet most of the people in Iowa, so I can tell a story from the meet people that I met. And I think they are, you know, that group of wonderful people here. But then that made me realize it is true that I don't have... Um, I, it's not a disadvantage. I just say like it's it's a very different kind of a AAPI experience compared to people who uh, immigrated to here uh, generations ago, and then they sort of have a family somewhere else, or they grew up here for a long time, so they can you know they, they can sort of have connections, have known people somewhere else. Um, I guess, again, the challenge for me is that uh, I'm still very fresh of the boat and I I'm, I feel like I, I still need to know a lot of people and uh, to build a relationship with people maybe outside of Iowa that made me realize, oh, maybe I need to travel a little bit more to meet other Asian filmmakers. And, um, and uh, I think that's a struggle essentially for um, for the uh, protagonist in my in my film is that uh, we have a very similar experience. We came to the U.S. to study. You know, uh, we are we were international students, and we don't have friends and family here. So how can we mm. start a completely new life? You know, in a foreign, in a new country, in a new place, um, and that's a story just similar to a lot of the first generations. The you know. Um, API family story that when they first came to the U.S. and then they don't know many people, how could they start? How could they um, build up a life in, in, in the U.S. and then especially in, in the rural Midwest place? Um, and 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for unpacking that. Um, a, a, just a bit how um, I think that's really important. And, you know, the Firelight fam and, you know, ADOC and CAM that was um, mentioned earlier, certainly spaces to kind of embrace you and and just like the, the filmmaking community, the Asian filmmaking community as a whole. Um, so the next question that I have is for um, each of you. Would love to hear your thoughts around this and um, feel free to, to jump in however y'all see fit. Um, I'm just curious whether your approach um, and your work that centers AAPI characters um, differently, perhaps with a sense, is there more at stake or a responsibility to get the portrait right um, versus maybe a, a, a film that you're telling that's not about an AAPI character? Um, so just any thoughts that you have in terms of um, what comes up for you when you're specifically telling AAPI stories? I would say the simple answer to that is yes, it does feel like the stakes are higher when you're doing a story about your community. Um, in part because the community is looking to you and feels like it has the authority to comment on your work in a different way. I think um, actually my the fellowship that I have through Firelight with um, Frontline, I have a short film that's coming out in the summer um, about a man who's in, uh, incarcerated um, in Florida uh, under a really... Uh, crazy law where he he's got life in prison for some um, what I think people would think would questionable uh, questionably um, unsevere crimes. Um, that's about a white um, a white man, and it was one of those things where even when I was pitching it in the Firelight space, knowing that I was you know partially sponsored by um, Firelight and also Frontline, whether whether I should be making a story about this white man when there were other um, subjects I could have chosen and. Um, I ultimately decided he was the best story. Um, he had the most compelling and interesting um, um, tale. And also, um, I think this film has the ability to make some change. And I think it's important to remember that it's not only Black men that are incarcerated. There are many, many more white people incarcerated. And um, if if it brings different kind of eyeballs to that subject, um, um, it, it might help. It might help. Uh, fix a system that is disproportionately fixing, uh, affecting black men. And so, um, I mean, that was sort of a long discussion I had with myself about even choosing to do that story. Um, I feel, you know, I, I, for my first film, Nine Man, I spent about seven years in Chinatowns and I really got to know people and really um, got to be part of the community. And I felt like I have done that. I've been there for seven years. I need to go out and do something different. Um, and then I started looking around and realizing that there were still not enough people making films about our communities and that if I wasn't going to make these films, who was going to make them there? You know, there are a lot of people tuning in today on YouTube. There are a lot of filmmakers in this room, um, but we still don't have enough represent representation out there. So if I stop making films about Chinatown, if I stop making films about our community, who's going to make them? I mean, are there enough people poised um, with enough resources, enough connections to get them to big distribution outlets? I hope so. But um I still feel a responsibility to tell stories about the community. And when I'm telling them, I do feel an added responsibility to the community. Yeah, it's a great answer and really thoughtful in so many regards. I think that authenticity is something that I, I brought up earlier and it continues to be a question that drives a lot of everything I do, no matter what the subject matter is. Um, I think something that has been coming up for me in, in through this work and through this project is just, you know, the diversity of the Asian American experience and just the Asian experience in general and how we find space to kind of explore and, and unpack these ideas. Um, I just recently read a beautiful memoir that I could recommend to everyone called Stay True by Hua Su, who is a New Yorker writer who... Um, wrote this fantastic uh, memoir that really begins to unpack a lot of um, these types of ideas. And he's a beautiful writer. <laughs> I don't want to uh, butcher his intellectualism, but just to say that he is a Taiwanese immigrant, but then his close friend is a, a multi-generation removed Japanese American. And so even within the Asian experience and the Asian American identity, there's so much diversity and so much complexity about who we are and what we are that continuing to carve out um, space for all of us to kind of pursue the stories that matter and continue to deepen and, com and complicate those ideas, I think is super critical for me going forward and knowing 
um, how to look at these ideas and how to look at the identity in a multifaceted three-dimensional way. Um, you know, there's no, there's no problem with something as, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to talk about crazy rich Asians without sounding mean. So I'll just say that it's resonant and it's important and it's great that a film like that can drive people into the theater. Um, but it feels like that just has to be the start of something. And I think it is, you know. I'm glad you brought up that book because that just won a Pulitzer and it's an awesome book and I was going to bring it up too. Um, sort of harking back to the conversation that you were having about um, telling stories from a certain place. I, I just moved cross country a couple months ago and I feel a little crippled because, um, you know, Hua talks a lot about East Coast Asians and West Coast Asians um, in a lot of the conversations with Ryan Wong and other folks surrounding his book and, and the stories within it. And I grew up as an East Coast Asian. I grew up as a mixed race East Coast Asian and my perspective is very specific. And I feel like that's really present in my films. So I wonder how you West Coast Asians like perceive them. Um, but I also feel like a little crippled now that I'm here in Oakland, which I forgot to mention is also the ancestral um, space of the Confederated Villages of Lishan. Um, and uh, I feel like I, I, I knew I knew a story immediately when I saw it, when it came, when I was coming from a community um, from which the story emerged. And now that I'm in a new space, I feel like I don't know all the players. I don't know all the characters. And how long am I going to have to sit here in Oakland before I feel like I'm capable of telling these stories? I think Firelight Media is really great about talking about authorship and who should be telling these stories. Um, and part of telling a story is, you know, sitting seven years in Chinatown to learn the community. But if you're... Um, you know, even just getting, just starting to shoot, starting to build these stories, you have to feel like you're, you're at a, you have to know where your perspective is and like how far away you are from the subject, how much you know, how much you don't know. And, and sometimes it can be really crippling. So I'm sort of stuck in that space right now as a, as a new transplant and I'm hoping for some magical wisdom to come my way. Um, how I want to give you space if you wanted to also uh, respond as well to this question. Yeah, I would just also want to echo what Dusty and uh, Ursula was was talking about uh, too. Um, oh, sorry guys, if you can hear some music from the background, that's because um, there's a some music playing, piano playing that I cannot control. Um, uh, I I feel deeply related related to that too. Is that uh, I just moved from Iowa to Ohio for about like less than a year, and then. I was kind of struggling about like, okay, how can I start a new life in another Midwest state that I don't know anyone? And then I, I'm not, I'm not the right person to tell this story. If I just met the story or the person there, um, who has the right, right? Um, and and that maybe that's the reason why I keep coming back to I want to make more stories is because I feel like um, I'm. I feel comfortable telling stories that I feel I'm the right person other than, oh, you're just a newcomer and now you want to tell these stories that you don't, you're not even familiar with. Um, and uh, I think for me, I'm still working, th working through this whole idea of, um, again, who has the right to tell the story as an Asian filmmaker and especially AI, API you know, community is so diverse, is so, um, so, so complex that uh, I'm not the right person to tell the story that uh, is not really too close to my cultural background or to my personal um, story. Um, can I tell a story that is completely not from my own culture? I, I, I don't know how to answer that, that question. I'm still navigating again, trying to figure out <laughs> what's the best way or what's the best um, approach for, for, for that. Uh, I, I think your, your response was beautiful, How I think that in and of itself is that we don't always have all the answers and the solutions and, and we lean on each other for that. Um, and, you know, just like in terms of this idea that we are the experts here that are talking about these things, again, we're all learning, we're all growing, we're all evolving. And so I think you really kind of echoed that spirit. And also the, the piano in the background is actually very beautiful. Um, your voice was still very full. Um, so we got some questions coming through, and I, I do want to transition to that here in a bit. So again, I invite 
Um, those who are here, uh, if you have questions, um, this has been a really beautiful, rich conversation. So would love to hear from audience members in terms of what is uh, percolating for you. But the, the, the question that I don't want to get to is kind of uh, coming full circle. Um, we were able to bring some AAPI cultural change makers and icons into this space. And the question is, if you had a blank check or because it's not just about money, if you had infinite resources in terms of support, capacity, and um, just like infrastructural support, um, what what AAPI icon um, story would you want to tell in this moment? This is just a moment for dreaming, a visioning. Um, what's coming up for you in terms of what story that you're really excited to tell for each of you? I can start. Um, huh. It's a it's an awesome question. It's a fun one. There, I have a I have a practical answer, and then maybe the more uh, pie in the sky dream one. But the practical answer goes back to where I started, which is like it's a dream of mine to try and tell the Ichiro Suzuki story in documentary form. I think there's a lot of meat on the bone there, just in terms of his impact and legacy across the Asian diaspora that hasn't been properly contextualized yet. Um, not to mention just his like rich, enigmatic kind of cult of personality that I find to be very fascinating. So I'm at like very early stages of trying to move the needle on something like that. Um, but in terms of other kind of ambitious ideas, there's a novel, um, this, this writer, I'm blanking on the writer's name, but the novel is called No, No Boy. And it's, um, it, it's the writer only wrote one book and it was No, No Boy. And it was about uh, someone that a Japanese American who defied uh, both going to the internment camps and both also denied going into the U.S. military. So um, in my family, a lot of the men of that generation, they all enlisted rather than being in, imprisoned. They went to World War II and fought in the war. The people that didn't fight for the U.S. Army and didn't want to go to the internment camps were literally sent to prison and they were called No-No Boys. And so I would love to. And so the novel No-No Boy tells the story of uh, a Japanese American guy who comes out of prison post World War II back to Seattle to uh, see what the world has uh, looks like now in the 50s post World War II. And it's a really fascinating, complex, kind of dark and a little bit depressing story that I think has like a, a really rich uh, cinematic possibility. So that would be another dream project of mine. I feel like I'm um, disheartened by the state of the industry and how much it's pushing towards specific things like celebrity um, and things that could be marketed in very specific ways and, and how little there is for indie filmmakers and left on the bone. It's all really commissions and the commission films that you have to pitch uh, have to have a certain amount of marketability. So I think, you know, if you were to give me the money, I wouldn't make one of those films. I wouldn't choose a cultural icon that, um, that I could maybe get money from Netflix to do. I would choose to do like the C-list celebrities. That's what I, you know, I feel like every time I've done a film where I've interviewed these um side characters, these tertiary characters to support the the story that I'm telling, there's always like a two hour long interview that's really fascinating and doesn't doesn't serve the film. But I feel like there's so many of those stories that I would love to elevate in a different way. And so it's it's sort of like I, I want to make the C-listers film and let those people have like their full um their full moment. It's the, you know, I think and New York Times at some point started doing this sort of like obituaries that never were. And I, I always had this dream. I used to work at the New York Times that they wouldn't it wouldn't be the obituaries that weren't, you know, that were correcting some sort of celebrity from the past. But it would be literally the doorman that died last week. Um, somebody random, you know, just pick the social security number out of out of the air and and give that guy their perfect, like full obituary. And you know, not to say that I want to cover people that are dead, but it's just like I think that there's. Uh, there's so much humanity and average and uncelebrated things that I really want to see more of on screen. Hal, I also invite you to dream here. Yeah, I, I think there's one person that come come up immediately because I mean, Iowa is the uh, founder of the uh, international writing program at the Writers Workshop uh, at the University of Iowa. Uh, her name is Walin Ye. Um, she is uh, she is a person who founded International Writer 
writing program which invites um, invited you know writers across the world to come to Iowa to have like a couple of months of writing residency and then this uh, that made Iowa City become really rich in terms of you know um, a lot of like writers cultural exchange there's a many many famous writers coming in from China Taiwan all across the world not just from Asia um, I think her story definitely deserved to to be told, um, and uh, and she's still alive. Yeah. I I love all these answers. Um, looking at all the organizations here in the space, um, I think these are stories that need to be told. Um, so, question from the chat that I'm going to build off of, actually, if that's okay, from the person who asked it. It is, what advice would you give other AAPI filmmakers? And the piece that I wanna to add to that is what advice would you give yourself um, from when you started, from what you know now? Um, so both, what would you give, what advice would you give AAPI filmmakers and what advice would you give yourself? I think I would give myself a little bit of different advice now than I would have two years ago. I had a baby two years ago and I've had to start making films in a different way and I think when you strive for perfection and make in filmmaking and you're really focused on details, which I think is a critical skill set for making films, sometimes you spend so much time on um, on details and so much agony on details that ultimately audiences don't see. And um, the last film I made was made in uh, you know like nine months compared to the previous films, which were made over several years. And um, and we we didn't have the time to address all the details when we were making that film. But I think the audience is still um, pulled the essence of the film out of it. And so I think I would give myself the advice just to like for be a little more forgiving um, with your own film. Um, and the advice I would give to other people if they're not so hard on themselves as I was, is to really build a community. Um, it's a really long road and it's really, um, but it's a really fun place to work if you surround yourself with the right people. Um, it, it, my community has, I, I've been very aggressive about finding community, especially now that I moved to a new place. Um, you need to know your neighbors, you need to know other filmmakers, you need to know, um, you know, the people that empty the trash, all these people like ultimately will help you in some way. And so really, really be aggressive about talking to people and building community because you need a lot of support in making films. I, I I really really want to echo what you just said. It's it all about like knowing people because um, not just knowing other filmmakers, you know, um, but also knowing the people who are surrounding you. And a lot of wonderful story for me personally, it's because I just happened to talk to someone to know the people that really close to me that I have never imagined I would have made a story out of it like my last short film here hopefully and then my upcoming film which I'm making right now also um it is for making it is a, you, sometimes you do need to develop a skill set of you not networking but talk to people knowing their stories I think um, if you are not interested in other people's story, I don't think you you should continue pursuing filmmakers. Maybe you should reflect like, are you the right person to be a filmmaker? Because um, it is hard to um, you know just keep to yourself and don't open yourself to to other people or to allow other people to tell their stories to you. Um, I think that will be my story to actually to myself too, I feel like I was a little bit more closed that um, I wasn't talking to many, as many people as I wished. Uh, so I will really say that just talk to anyone and, 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 and sometimes you can find beautiful stories, but also you can find a really good community by connecting with um, many, many other people. I echo my panelists. I mean, well, first of all, I didn't know you could make a movie in nine months. So I just need to learn more from Ursula just in general. Um, as someone who's very uh, 
obsessive and I, I can't, I would not call myself a perfectionist, but someone that really pushes myself to get those details right. So anyway, that's a comfort, that's a longer conversation for another day. Um, I'm also in a, you know, I, I grew up in Chicago uh, or grew up in Evanston right next to Chicago. And then I lived in New York for about 11 years. And then I lived in Miami for a couple of years and I'm just now returning to Chicago. So this was the first project I made since I've moved back here. And I also am putting an effort towards more community-based filmmaking. And that doesn't, to Ursula's point, it doesn't mean just, uh, filmmakers it just means the community around you and the people around you and i and i think that that is really valuable so i i echo that and then um in terms of advice i give i would give to myself and would give to aspiring filmmakers i think that um sometimes people forget that filmmaking is like a craft like any other art form like you know, I, I had a young filmmaker after screening ask me a similar question. And I said, well, you know, if you wanted to learn to play the guitar or learn to play an instrument, you would get the instrument, you would practice it, and you would do it. So I think when I was younger, sometimes I would forget that um, directing, editing, shooting, producing, all these things are crafts and you have to do them and you have to get work. You have to put in the hours and really, um, yeah, chase that ambition that you feel like you have. And for this project in particular, I, I made the effort to kind of go back to square one, so to speak, and say I was going to shoot it myself, say I was going to edit it myself and really kind of push myself to um, work on the craft of filmmaking again, because I think it's something we, we all can get wrapped up in the ideas and the, you know, creation of pitch decks and the pitching and all this other stuff that just isn't filmmaking, you know, so just getting back to filmmaking itself. Thank you so much for all of your responses. Um, I, I think in my mind, um, in terms of my very strange concept of, of time, I thought we would be able to move through many more questions, but um, this has just been a really wonderful conversation. And I, I think we um, can, maybe can lean into the spirit of what Ursula shared in terms of building that community. So any questions that we weren't able to get to, any points that were raised here in this space that you want to follow up on, I invite you to, to reach out um, to me and to the, the larger filmmaking community as a whole, the Firelight family, um, the ADOC and CAM family, also the Working Films family. Um, let's, again, just learn from each other and continue to grow from each other. Um, I want to thank the panelists. Ursula, Dusty, and Hal, you are all so brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your gifts and your insights and your truth with us today uh, for Beyond Resilience, AAPI Cultural Icons. Um, I especially want to thank the audience for joining. Um, thank you for being a part of this conversation. Uh, you can learn more about each of the panels here from today's conversation by visiting firelightmedia.tv. Um, and with that, I hope you stay safe, be kind to yourself and have a really beautiful evening. Thank you all.